Good afternoon again. I am Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater and we host the Fairhaven Lecture Series each semester. This semester we're talking about remarkable women and we have certainly a group of them to learn about today. I'll introduce today's speaker. Ann Durst has taught at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater in the Department of Educational Foundations since 2002. Before coming to UW-Whitewater, she was an instructor at the University of California, Davis. While in California, she also taught elementary school in a Sacramento charter school. Previously, she worked as a researcher in the area of school reform in New York City, as a preschool teacher in New Mexico and Paris, and as an instructor in American history and history of education. She finished her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a dissertation on the history of daycare in the United States. Her recent research includes a historical study of the University of Chicago's laboratory school community, 1896 to 1904. She is currently working on a study of the Eagleswood School, an experimental school started by abolitionists in the mid 19th century. Welcome, Dr. Ann Durst. Thank you very much. As Carrie said, it's wonderful to see you all here on a beautiful day outside. I'm glad that you were able to take some time to, to come and join me for uh, my talk on uh, Women and Girls of Eagleswood, Utopianism, Abolitionism, and Educational Experimentation. So Eagleswood was a school of the 1850s. And as we all know, the 1850s was followed by a decade of such magnitude, uh, the election of Lincoln, uh, many believe uh, him to be our greatest president, the Civil War, the assassination of Lincoln and the great national mourning that followed that, uh, the attempts at reconstruction of the South and the whole country. Um, such magnitude um, during that decade that we, we often tend to lose the decade before and it's, it seems to perpetually to have been in its shadow. But as they were living it, the 1850s were a decade of intense turmoil and decisions of great import by government and individuals, particularly about the central issue of the time, which was slavery. As Eric Foner argues in a recent uh, history of the Underground Railroad, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, um, quote, required citizens to assist in the capture of fugitives and forced ordinary northerners who had no connection with the abolitionist movement to confront the question of the relationship between individual conscience and legal ob obligation. So all as a result of the Fugitive Sla Slave Act, all were either complicit with slavery or lawbreakers. And Northerners saw fugitives such as Anthony Burns uh, returned by the state of Massachusetts to slavery. So abolitionism during this time was spreading. Though anti-slavery activists were still seen by many whites as radical or ultra was the, the term at the time for radical thoughts. Um, and that label was not just for someone like John Brown, who as, uh, was most famous for his willingness to die to end slavery after the Harper's uh, Ferry. So, Raid. Um, Barbara Smith Bodichon, an English visitor to the U.S. in 1857 and 58, and we'll, I'll talk about her a bit later because she also visited the school, Eagleswood, um, as part of her visit. Um, she wrote, some great questions there are which are ever before us. Every hour of the day brings up occasion of action involving these questions, and we have to consider how we shall act and we see what is the result of our action. It was evident to many at this time that change was unavoidable, and in response, some took action in a, in a number of different ways to try to figure out how to guide that change and improve their world. Um, so in addition to anti-slavery efforts, some turned to utopianism. Um, essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson was said to have declared that mid-century America was so infatuated with utopias that, quote, not a reading man, but has a draft of some community in his waistcoat pocket. Women were agitating for their rights, as we'll see, I'll talk about that as well today, and calls were made for educational reform, leading to the common school movement and the establishment of free public schools. Uh, luminaries, and this is a word which I love, luminaries, and when I read uh, letters from this time, that, that was a word used um, during, during this period. Luminaries of these interconnected movements came together for a brief moment in time at Eagleswood School in Raritan Bay Union, 
which was a utopian community in New Jersey, in a beautiful spot in Perth Amboy, um, not too far from New York City. The school was started in 1854 by abolitionists pictured here, Theodore Weld, Angelina Grimke Weld, his wife, and Sarah Grimke, Grimke um, her sister. Uh, th theirs was really a remarkable story. Um, the Grimke sisters were from a South Carolina slaveholding family, but they came to abhor slavery, the two sisters, and fight against it um, publicly, eventually, in, in lectures in northern cities and towns. They were among the first, if not the first, female anti-slavery agents in the 1830s. That was an official, a, a term used for those who were going around the, the, the North um, and giving talks, lectures against slavery. It was in this work that um, Theodore Weld met the sisters. Um, they started out, the sisters started out speaking just to female audiences because at that time an audience like this with mixed uh, males and females was called promiscuous. Um, so, and so they were not, they eventually um, uh, spoke to these kinds of promiscuous audiences. And um, some men were not, not willing, not, not uh, brave enough, I would say, perhaps, to, to sit in these promiscuous audiences. So there are reports of some men uh, outside looking in through the windows at the, at the, um, at the lectures. Um, particularly Theodore Weld and Angelina Grimke Weld were, were gifted orators. Um, you know, you read about them and, and, and what some of the reports say is they were mesmerizing. And they would speak on for, at quite some length, and they actually had um, quite large audiences, sometimes in the hundreds of people. I think one I read was uh, a thousand. Um, so, so people went to a lot of lectures. <laughs> so what you're doing is, is what was quite typical in, in the 1850s, um, going to lectures. Um, so Raritan Bay Union was started in 1853 by another abolitionist couple, though a wealthier one. Uh, their names were Rebecca and Marcus Spring. And they had broken off from another utopian community to form the Raritan Bay Union, which was to distinguish, distinguish itself um, in part by focusing on education. So they were really trying to recruit the Grimke Welds. Um, Sarah Grimke joined her sister Angelina and uh, Theodore Weld at a farm in Belleville, that's where they were living when, when the Raritan Bay was started, um, and they had started a school at this home. Uh, it was a boarding school. Uh, a lot of the kids were kids who were, as we'll, we'll see with Eagleswood was true as well, um, children of reformers. And so they had a bit of a name uh, for themselves as teachers, and so the Springs really tried to recruit the Grimke Welts. Um, it took a little while to do so, it took about a year or so. Um, and in the meantime, they were trying to, to get others, they were trying to recruit other families like the Grimke Welds. And one um, family they tried to recruit for the utopian community was the family of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who is probably one of the most, along with Susan B. Anthony, one of the most famous women's rights activists of, of this time. Um, she was keen to try the social experiment. Um, by the way, her son was, uh, one of their sons, their eldest, I think, was at the Belleville School that the Grimkes and Grimke Welds had started. So she was keen to try this experiment. She declared in a letter, all our talk about women's rights is mere moonshine so long as we are bound by the present social system. She had, they had lots of, they had a, uh, you know, a growing family of young children. Um, but her husband, she wrote, had a horror of all associations of the kind proposed. So they did not join this. Sarah Grimke was also quite skeptical about, uh, sometimes they called it association life. Um, shortly after arriving at Raritan in 1854, she wrote, if there are any blessings in unitary life, I have thus far failed to realize them. The connections between the school and the utopian community seem not to, to uh, bring very many uh, positive gains to the family and, and to the school. Um, the union, unfortunately, seems to have been poorly run. The Grimke Welds were disappointed that it didn't enable them to save money. And what they wanted to do, one of the reasons they moved from Belleville to this uh, beautiful looking school. The school was in the building on the right. The Springs home was the home on the left. Um, one of the reasons they moved was that they wanted to be able to enroll students of what they called moderate means. So they wanted to be able to, to charge less to, to students of families that didn't have a lot of money. And they were able to do that to some extent, but that, not to the extent that they wanted. Um, so the utopian community proved short-lived, and in fact the school outlasted it. 
By 1856, Sarah Grimke was pleased to report that she believed the association had ended. And she was curious to see if the school would thrive as a combination boarding school and boarding house. Um, in spite, this is in her, in her words, in spite of all the heterodoxy and bloomerism, et cetera, et cetera, of the principles. Uh, so Raritan Bay Union and Eagles would attract a quite an array of what one student called Mr. Weld's distinguished friends. It was something of, uh, something like a European salon. There were visitors, all kinds of reform-minded mi uh, visitors who came to do lectures. Um, there were plays. Um, there were debates. Um, when civil disobedience author and unusual fellow himself, Henry David Thoreau, visited Raritan in 1856 to survey the land and to give lectures to the community, he encountered, this was in a letter he wrote back to his sister, Angelina Weld in extreme bloomer costume, which you might call remarkable. Um, this is not Weld, of course, but uh, it's uh, a picture of the, the bloomers. Sarah Grimke wore the bloomer costume, as they called it, um, not for quite as long as Angelina, as her sister. Um, she wrote about bloomers, it does so violate my taste and is so opposed by my secretiveness. Um, so as she stated, she and her sister and brother-in-law had radical ideas on just about everything, on daily matters such as clothing and food. Um, they subscribed for a while to what was called a Gramite diet, which was um, very Spartan, gram flour, no stimulants. Um, and uh, so they, they had radical ideas about those kinds of daily matters and also on profound matters of, uh, such as racial and gender equality. Not all fellow abolitionists shared those beliefs. Um, the school was shaped by the Grimke Weld family's ultra ideas. So my focus today will be on the women and the girls of the school, given our theme this semester with the Fairview Lecture series. Um, the, the school attracted mostly like-minded families, central of whom were members of an interconnected network of reformers that one contemporary called the Northern Emancipationist Circle in upstate New York and Philadelphia. The families um, were, the, the central families were the Wright, Mott, McKim families. And the students, they called themselves scholars, and they were called scholars at the time. Scholars included Ellen Wright, who's in the middle here, and she's one of the ones I'm going to use her letters to, to kind of describe the school. Um, these are her brothers, Frank and Willie, both of whom attended the school as well. Um, Ellen Wright wrote that she was thankful to be bred among reformers, and indeed she was. She was the daughter and niece of two of the women who organized the Seneca Falls Convention for the Rights of Women in 1848, with the more famous Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Her mother was Martha Coffin Wright, and her aunt was Lucretia Coffin Mott. Another scholar was Anna Davis, her, her I guess, second cousin, Lucretia Mott's granddaughter, the lower photo here. Um, and I'll explain the photo album for a minute. Um, she, Anna Davis, who was one of the scholars at the school, helped organize a reunion of students in the, in the 1860s, and then she organized this photo album, which I was able to actually look at and hold. Um, the archives of the, the Weld Grimke family are kept at the Clements Library at University of Michigan. And I have to tell you about, um, so this was fragile enough, but I was able, they gave me a big box of items that I could look at, like a teeny little tea set. I was terrified that I was going to break something, though. And the one thing I was most terrified and that, that I was actually able to hold was a glasses case of Angelina's, and Angelina Grimke Weld's eyeglasses. I mean, here they are, you know, decades old. And I, I took it out really slowly and then really put it right back in. I, I didn't even want to have them out of their case. I was, I was so scared. But it's, it's just an amazing collection to look at. Um, so she organized this uh, photo album. Uh, the next scholar, um, and these were all friends, uh, was um, their friend Lucy McKim, whose father, Miller McKim, was an abolitionist who was active in the Underground Railroad. They were from Philadelphia. Um, at Mrs. Spring, so Rebecca Spring, the, one of the, the part of the couple who organized the, the utopian community, um, at, they were at, Lucy and Ellen were at her home when Bronson Alcott was visiting. He's, he was a reformer himself, but probably most famous for being the father of Louisa May Alcott, um, the author of Little Women. Um, so he was visiting, and Ellen Wright reported to her mother that she was introduced to Mr. Alcott as, quote, 
Lucretia Mott's niece, as usual, and Lucy as daughter of the one who tapped on the box. So that is kind of a cryptic reference, um, and I think perhaps in part because they were, she was trying to be secret about the Underground Railroad. But what it refers to is the story of Henry Box Brown, Box in, in quotes as, a, as in a kind of a part of a nickname. He was a slave who escaped by mailing himself to Philadelphia in a wooden crate. Uh, he was in that crate for they, over 20 hours. Um, and Miller McKim, so her father, Lucy's father, was one of the men who received him and assisted up him upon uh, arrival. And it's said that he knocked on the box to, to let him know that they were there. Um, he's another really unheralded, unheralded figure in U.S. history, I think, as, as many of these figures here in, in this story. Um, but I did see this was kind of a triumph for history, I thought. Uh, recently, I was in the grocery store and I was looking at the, the Oprah magazine. And I opened it up, and in there was um, uh, a review of the book that I mentioned by Eric Foner, this new book on the Underground Railroad. And there was a picture of Miller McKim right in the middle of Oprah magazine. So I practically cheered out loud in the grocery store. <laughs> so uh, uh, hopefully they will get their due. This, they're just, uh, you know, just uh, uh, I've been finding them so interesting to, to learn about and read about. So these families, along with the Grimke Welds and the family of William Lloyd Garrison, another abolitionist, uh, Lucy and Ellen married Garrison sons. To, uh, so they ended up being sisters-in-law in, in, in addition to friends. Um, these families preserved their many letters and, and diaries as well, which help us understand life at this school. So Ellen Wright called Eagleswood a wonderful and delightful school. And her friend Lucy McKim called it that most radical of all places. Judging from the many letters written by the children of the Wright Mont McKim families, it seemed to be both a joyous place full of skating, swimming, excursions, gymnastics, dancing, acting, performing. Um, and these activities coexisted with quite serious scholarly endeavors in Shakespeare, compositions, debates, trigonometry, Latin, and Greek, taught using pedagogical methods that were atypical in an age of memorization, towing the line, uh, recitation. So the, the Grimke Welds, and uh, as I've been saying, and most of the families involved were abolitionists and supporters of women's rights. And in keeping with these beliefs, the boarding school was racially integrated and co-educational. Um, some in the historical records say it was one of a very few of its kind. Some even say it was the first um, that was uh, racially integrated and co-educational as a boarding school, I think. Um, so, so, so far in my, in my look at the archives, I have not been able to identify a lot of African Americans in the historical record. What I need to do, um, Theodore Well kept a log of the uh, lists of the, of the students, of the scholars. And so what I do is, per is look up their, the, the names on, on the web, really. Um, and because more digital rec more records are digitized as uh, you know every day practically, I do that periodically. So that's and I've uncovered um, you know some of the different uh, figures who have um, who have gone to this school. Um, so, but some I have found. For instance, Hattie Purvis. Um, she was a, a friend of Ellen Wright's the daughter of Robert and Harriet Fortin Purvis from two of the leading black families involved in abolition and women's rights in the country. Um, they were located in Philadelphia. Uh, she seemed to have been integrated um, in, the, in the school's activities, had friends um, uh, as, as others. Um, other black children perhaps not as intimately included as, as Hattie Purvis. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the attitudes and the, the, uh, the ways in which kids of different racial backgrounds interacted at the school. And here, here are some of the things I've found out. So um, Anna Davis wrote that after Theodore Well gave an anti-slavery speech at the school in 1858 that brought students to tears, um, she remarked that she thought that her fellow scholars needed, quote, a rousing on the slavery question as they seemed to her to be, in her, her words, shockingly indifferent. Um, there was also, quite remarkably, um, a, a, a girl who was attending the school who was a slave. Her father was a white slaveholder, her white slaveholder, um, and so I'm trying to figure out her experiences there. Um, there, were, there was another story Ellen Wright told about four African American children who joined the school in, in its later years, and as a result, a few of the white boys left 
Ellen Wright said, um, called them simpletons, the boys who left, and thought the school would be better off without them. Um, and then she also wrote about another student, Mary Morris, is, in, these are in her words, Mary Morris is pro-slavery, and she says she's going home because we pick her so about it. We are to have a discussion next Sunday on slavery. So I'm still puzzling this out, um, but it seems that at a time when, as historian James Oakes argues, even the new Republican Party was not eager to discuss issues of race and racial equality, such matters were topics of discussion at Eagleswood. Um, so um, Eagleswood seemed, judging again from the same lists of students, it seemed to be fairly evenly divided between boys and girls. Um, and my focus today is on the ideas and practices related to the education of girls, given our, our theme of um, remarkable women. Reformer Frances Gage visited in 1859, and she was delighted to see a school, she wrote an article about it, um, where, quote, girls are encouraged to take vigorous physical exercise, where boys and girls are educated together, she has that in italics. The girls, she noted, can swim, lift weights, play ball, ride and run, ah, and get lessons too, study Greek and Latin and read Shakespeare and advance equally with those who are fitting for Cambridge and Yale. Of course, they couldn't attend those universities, um, even if they were advancing equally at Eagleswood. Um, so this was a time when women's higher education was still very unusual, and there weren't really many professional opportunities available to women. Um, and a few decades later, in the 1870s, there was a um, treatise published by Dr. Edward Clark against co-education, um, sex in education, he called it, and he argued that uh, young women should study no more than four hours because other, each day because otherwise it was going to interfere with their reproductive abilities down the road. So, so it's quite remarkable that at Eagleswood, the girls had equal access to rigorous academic and physical activity, and I think that it provided these girls with the opportunity to develop oppor uh, abilities that might enable them to be self-reliant as adults. And it seems that the, these activities were designed to contribute to the furtherance of women's rights. Um, Sarah Grimke believed that, quote, if we could rouse a spirit of independence in a woman, our work as to her rights would be accomplished. So I'm, I'm thinking, so this is really at the center of what I'm trying to figure out here. I'm exploring how the Grimke Weld's radical views on human rights, as they term them, with capitals, just as it's written up here. Um, how did their ideas, their ultra ideas on human rights, inform their educational theories and practices? Um, Sarah Grimke wrote to Henry Bellows, whose children would later enroll at Eagleswood, that if women had equal rights, and this is the quote up here, they would be able to, quote, take enlarged and comprehensive views, to think for themselves, to reason out a point, and form their own conclusions. So it follows that if girls had equal educational opportunities, as Sarah Grimke herself had not, she had limited education, um, some limited, she was mostly self-taught, some limited help from her father and one of her brothers. But if girls did have equal educational opportunities, they could develop independence of mind and the desire to fight for additional rights. Remember that female suffrage did not come to the United States until 1920. So it was quite a ways off. So here are my questions that I'm, um, that I'm puzzling about. So does a desire for equal rights come from opportunities to think for oneself? Or does one have to think for oneself in order to desire and agitate for equal rights? What did the Grimke Welds and other teachers think about this? And what is the role of education in shaping such views? Eagleswood School provided opportunities for scholars to develop these interconnected aspirations and abilities. Boys and girls, black and white, well-to-do, and those who were of moderate means that they were able to help um, pay the tuition for. Uh, Barbara Smith Bodichon, that English visitor who I mentioned earlier, she wrote um, after visiting Eagleswood, I never saw such a satisfactory group of young people in my life. Mr. Weld is working out every day his principles of equal advantages for black or white or male or female. So um, I have to add, Henry David Thoreau, when he visited, didn't uh, really agree with her, at least in the beginning of his visit, about the young people. Who thought, he thought that they didn't meet the standards of New England young people. Um, and for Ellen Wright, if I read her correctly, 
The feeling was somewhat mutual. She thought Henry David Thoreau was by far the strangest piece of humanity that I ever saw. But I have to qualify that. I can't, I, I think she said strangest in her letter, but it could have been strongest, which would have been a much more positive view of Thoreau. Um, but I'm pretty sure she was the, that was an A and not an O, and she said the strangest. Um, the experiment of Eagleswood was to connect a belief in equal rights to educational methods that prompted children to think for themselves. So in addition to the Grimke Welds, the teaching corps at Eagleswood also included several other gifted female teachers mentioned often in students' letters, including Lucy Shepard, Catherine Innes, or Kitty Ireland, pictured here, um, Elizabeth Peabody, who was uh, uh, involved in the beginning of kindergartens in the US, and Eliza Ann Yeomans. Um, I would say that probably no one was mentioned more than Theodore Weld. He was beloved, um, and other male teachers as well, but I'm focusing on the female teachers um, because of our theme here. But I don't want it, um, I, I want to make sure that, that it's understood that Theodore Weld was a, was a very, very gifted teacher. Um, Eliza Yeomans, here, let me click to her. So she's pictured up there, it was part of that photo album. Um, Eliza Yeomans taught chemistry and botany at Eagleswood and wrote several books on botany some years later. Her brother Edward Yeomans um, also taught with the Welds, I think only at the Belleville School, though he, he was an occasional lecturer, I think, at Eagleswood. He founded Popular Science Monthly. He was a pretty renowned scientist himself. Um, he was actually had visually um, impaired and his sister, um, worked and, and did a lot of his written work for him and worked very closely with him. Um, so her written work from a later period illustrates the pedagogical basis for these unorthodox practices at Eagleswood. Um, in her, her book, which was called First Book of Botany, Designed to Cultivate the Observing Powers of Children, published in 1870, remember our preeminent American philosopher of education, John Dewey was just a child at this time, um, and his ideas later uh, were considered ahead of his time. When he, um, he started, uh, this was my early research on the laboratory school, he started in 1896. Um, so Yeoman set out to address what she considered to be nothing less than the true mental philosophy of education. Uh, Yeomans explained that the student, the student must, quote, make his own way and rely on nobody else. Traditional schools in her mind were, quote, deficient by making no adequate provision for cultivating the growth of ideas by the exercise of the observing powers of children. Her experiences led her to believe that children should, quote, be taught, this is the quote up here, be taught to see for themselves, she's got that in italics, and to think for themselves on the basis of what they have seen. In this way only can they learn to weigh the true value of evidence and to guard against that carelessness of assumption and that credulous confidence in the loose statements of others, which is one of the gross mental deficiencies we everywhere encounter. Whenever I read that, I think we could say that today. I mean, this was, she wrote this in 1870, and, and we always, it seems like we're always having that issue of um, wanting to have people really be able to, to make up their own minds and to make, it, make up their minds based on evidence. For Yeomans, true educa education must involve, quote, observing, inquiring, finding things out, and judging independently about them. Um, I teach in the teacher education program at Whitewater, and I, the last few semesters I've started my students with a column by Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist. He argues that in, in our changing time, it's not enough to have IQ, but we need what he calls PQ and CQ, passion quotient and curiosity quotient. So whenever I read this quote, I think about him, you know, writing in, in the 2000s, I think 13, 2013 or so, or 12. Um, so while this written work was published after her time at Eagleswood, the ideas align with the record on the school's pedagogical approach. So um, Pliny Earle, another wonderful name from the 1800s, um, Pliny Earle was a cousin of the Raritan Bay founder, Rebecca Spring, and he visited the school several times. He wrote in a publication, his memoirs in 1898, that he thought the school, on the whole, the best school I ever saw. His description of a classroom lesson taught by Theodore Weld closely illustrates the ideas outlined by Eliza Ann Yeomans. So Weld was teaching a natural philosophy um, class. He walked into the classroom with his arms full of tools, shears, hammers, steel yards, which I had to look up. It's some kind of a lever system. Um, uh, and uh, instructed the children, and this is a quote, 
Pliny Earl is quoting Weld now. Um, so he's talking, he's telling the children this. Examine the tools, examine them and be prepared, each of you to give a lecture on them, demonstrating the principle by which they each act. And please remember that I wish each of you in examining them to depend on his own powers of observation and not ask explanations from others. Earl thought that this is the way to make good scholars. He also um, mentioned a Shakespeare analysis. They did a lot of Shakespeare. It was one of Weld's passions with Shakespeare, and the, the, the children did a lot of analysis of Shakespeare. Um, so in the Shakespeare analysis, they should also rely upon, the student should rely upon himself um, and guard that he does not fall into the carelessness which always marks those whose teachers are constantly assisting them. Um, he also noted that the whole school, teachers, scholars, male and female, went to, quote, slide and skate on the ice. Even, and this is, this is uh, Pliny Earl, even Mrs. Weld, sober, staid, intellectual, Angelina Grimke that was, joined in the pastime. Um, this description reveals one of Weld's um, strong ideas about education, the importance of balancing physical and mental activities. And the language is quite similar to Eliza Ann Yeomans um, from from uh, the 1870s. Uh, a former student, Annalee Merritt, remembered the school as a place where students didn't just memorize, but were taught to think. Um, she mentioned in her memoir one trigonometry lesson that, that involves students walking on a hillside using surveying tools to measure distance and altitude. Um, she thought that that kind of experience um, enabled students to develop a true interest in their studies. So not just, uh, so really learning because they had an interest in, in what they were learning. So there was fun and a measure of freedom at this boarding school that girls were not likely to find elsewhere. Um, there's a wonderful term Lucy McKim used for a Thanksgiving party in New York that she attended. And it applied to many of the times described by Ellen Wright, Lucy McKim, and Anna Davis at Eagleswood. It was, the party was, she called, a grand jollification, which uh, is a word I just, a phrase I just wanted to use in this talk um, because it's such a great, 19th century phrase. Um, when one of her sisters visited Ellen Wright at the school, she remarked on Ellen's clothes, describing them as drapery that was baggy around the waist, fine for climbing fences. Ellen, Lucy, and Anna wrote often about their walks to the river to see the sunset. Um, Viola Hutchinson was another student. She was part of a family of singers, the Hutchinson family singers. They were anti-slavery singers um, during this time. Um, she wrote about learning how to swim at this school. So the girls found freedom and independence of thought and activity at Eagleswood, and there were also rewarding activities and opportunities for women as teachers um, to engage in these same kinds of, um, uh, the same kind of work and, and pastimes. Um, yet they not acknowledged that even at Eagleswood, conditions were not perfect. Um, as Anna Davis wrote of the girls' experience with high jumping, we larger ones, then she wrote an exclamation point, can go 34 inches but our having to hold our dresses with both hands is a great hindrance. <laughs> so I love that image of these girls, you know, trying their best to do the, the uh, high jump with holding their skirts. Um, so given limited opportunities for women of the late 19th century, some girls may have been left with hopes for action that didn't quite match expectations in the world outside of Eagleswood. Sarah Manning was a student um, who wrote to Theodore Weld after being at the school, I can't be a public man and I don't want to be a public woman. I wish you could tell me some good I can do. And Ellen Wright, who attended several schools in addition to Eagleswood, wrote from one of them, which was in Lenox, Massachusetts in 1861, we abolitionists receive little sympathy in this quarter. I feel more radical than ever. In spite of her time at a radical school, she wished for greater strength to wage battle against those who opposed her views. Um, she attended another school, Sharon Female Academy in Darby, Pennsylvania, and in, in an undated diary entry, and I should say, at the beginning of her diary, which I read on microfilm, um, she wrote, anyone who opens this without permission from its author will never go to heaven. <laughs> so I felt a bit badly um, not heeding her uh, warnings but I, I read on. Um, she wrote, how I long for sufficient eloquence to vindicate myself when attacked by those wasps of conventionalists. Conventionalists underlined. Yet she put a photo of John Brown up in a room at the Lenox School where classmates were unsympathetic to her beliefs. And she wrote in 1861 in her diary, I am a reformer and expect to be odious to many, but damn it. So I'm going to finish with this beautiful, beautiful photo, I think. This is the, the Welds and their, and their children. 
Um, I want to make a connection to today. Um, I think it's important to think about how we can match school practices to an articulated purpose, to a philosophy of education, to thinking about the school's role in the larger society. Um, what is or should be the connection between the larger purposes and the needs and realities of society, like Thomas Friedman's ideas about PQ and CQ, and the schools? Um, furthermore, uh, the question that, 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 I'm, that I feel to be central to my work, um, how did figures like Theodore Weld, Angelina Grimke Weld, and Sarah Grimke, and others, come to their own ideas about issues that, while clear to us now, were far from accepted in their own time. Um, ideas about women's rights, ideas about the equality uh, of men and women, the equality of, of those from all races. Um, if we consider this to be valuable, um, how do we foster that kind of independent thinking in children so that they can better guide wise, wise policy when they're adults and make good decisions as individuals? And just recently, at the beginning of the month, um, there was an article by David Kirp in the New York Times called Make School a Democracy. And he wrote about um, Escuela Nueva. It's uh, a, a, a program, a, a method of uh, schooling. Uh, he was focusing on Colombia. Um, he argues that regarding U.S. schools that are similar to this, so these are schools with much more um, uh, action in their, uh, much more um, learning by doing, you could say, um, schools that might resemble Eagleswood of the 1850s. He says there's solid evidence that American students do well when they are encouraged to think for themselves and expected to collaborate with others. So Eagleswood was doing this more than 150 years ago. And what I hope is that my research on an early American attempt to fashion this kind of education can contribute not just to the historical record of educational reform and innovation, but also to current efforts to try to provide children with the education they deserve. So um, I appreciate your, uh, um, your being here and you're such a lovely audience. Um, thank you very much. We have time for questions, if anyone has questions. Any questions? Let me take a moment, let it sink in. OK, I'll be right there. OK, here you go. How long did the school function? It went until about 1861. From 48 to? 54 to 61, yeah. And the reason that, um, well, the, the, there was a, very, a personal reason. The middle, actually, the middle child here, which is the, the one on the right, I think, um, he got very sick. And they never really figured out what was wrong with him. Um, and that was the, one, of the, one of the main reasons that they left the school. It was pretty successful for a while in there, um, but it actually was converted to a military academy after the, the welds left. Yeah. So it didn't last very long. Other, other questions? Here? OK. At our book club recently, we read The Invention of Wings by Sumon Kidd. Oh, good. And it's a phenomenal, although it's mm -hmm. fiction, it's mm -hmm. historical fiction. And she describes at length Sarah Grimke's mm -hmm. life and how it, it really is an incredible story. Yeah. Of, she truly was a, a daughter of a slaveholder. Yeah. And what a phenomenal transformation mm -hmm. she experienced in her mm -hmm. lifetime. Mm -hmm. I was curious, um, the author refers to her speech impediment, Sarah's hmm. speech impediment, um, and she seemed to indicate in the author's notes that there was actual documentation that indicated that she perhaps did have a speech hmm. impediment, which made it even more striking that mm -hmm. she was able to, well, in essence, force herself mm -hmm. to make these public presentations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's quite an inspiring story. Yeah, I'm so glad that you read that in, in, in a book club. I'm, I'm, I read the book as well, and I thought it was well done. Uh, I thought it was good. Um, yeah, she, she didn't like speaking publicly as much as her sister, and uh, was reported to be not as magnetic a, a speaker, a public speaker, but she did do it, uh, exactly, and, and it took a lot of courage for a lot of reasons. Yeah, that's great to hear that, yeah. Other? Okay. Those of us that grew up with little women and mm -hmm. eight cousins, mm -hmm. the references in them, which at the time reading 
meant nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, Demi being taught his mm -hmm. alphabet mm -hmm. by his grandfather, uh, the school that Joe and her husband mm -hmm. founded, mm -hmm. and in Little Women, I mean in uh, Eight Cousins, uh, Rose's uncle uh, outfitted her in a loose outfit <laughs> so that That's she could nice. run uh -huh. and jump and uh -huh. do all kinds of things uh -huh. while her aunties wanted her to be in the corsets and the restrictions. Mm. And today's lecture has really just sort of, oh, <gasps> why didn't I see that? <laughs> well, I really appreciate you remind. I grew up loving those books myself. I loved all of Louise May Alcott's books. And Little Men, uh, it was Plumfield, I think, right, was the school? Yeah. Is that the name of the school? Mm -hmm. um, I love those stories. And I'll have to read um, Eight Cousins again. That was one of my favorites as well. And I, I haven't reread them in light of this. So that's a, that's a great reminder to me to, to do that. Thank you so much. What a wonderful comment. What were okay. the main features of the utopian society? Were those just a group of people who had the same goals and mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so the question is about the, the utopian community. Um, they, they bought in together for the, each utopian community had a different structure. They, they, they all had, um, they had different ways of organizing themselves and different areas of focus. And uh, this one, I, well, I don't have the slide still up, but the, that big building had the school, it had some of the common areas. They had higher aspirations, like for some kind of um, way to, to uh, some industries that might enable them to make money, but they really didn't materialize. It didn't last very long at all, this, this particular utopian community. Um, so it's, from what I've read, and I haven't read widely on, uh, on some of the other utopias, and, um, and they had some fairly intricate beliefs about how they should live together, um, but there was a really fascinating letter that exchange between Sarah Grimke and, I can't remember his name now, but someone who was part of another um, utopia. And this other fellow wrote back saying he just didn't think people were really good enough to be able to live together so intimately like this. Um, and you know, we saw Sarah, Sarah Grimke missed, for instance, she missed the, the family meals that she had with her, her sister and her sister's husband and the three children back at, at, at when they lived on the farm together and even had the smaller school. Um, you know, that was a, a group of, I think, 20 kids. She missed that in the, in the large communal kinds of meals that they had at, at Raritan. So, um, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting part of 19th century history, I think, that, you know, like Emerson said, it seemed like everyone had a plan in their back pocket. Um, but I don't think many of them lasted very long. Yeah. Time for probably one more question, if anyone has one other question. Okay, otherwise I'm going to ask you to, to join me in thanking Professor Durst for her lecture today.